our subject is simply who or what do we obey? That's the question and the title of my address tonight. No, you're not. Perhaps I can substitute the word slaves for servants and follow more literally the original Greek as I read this text again. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves slaves to obey, his slaves ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Our King James Version has rendered the verse uh, delicately and made it just a touch more refined, but slaves is the term strictly intended. To whom ye yield yourselves slaves to obey, his slaves ye are. We are all slaves, all servants. We turn from God and we imagine we are free. If we turn away from God and we renounce the notion of God and we turn aside from any awareness that he follows us and knows about us, observes us, even further we turn away from the notion that there is a judgment and we're accountable to him and we have to explain ourselves one day. Well, if we do those things, we think we are morally free. We think we are free not to obey him. We've found freedom. We don't have to serve him. We don't even have to thank him for life, for strength, for gifts and abilities, for all the privileges that we have naturally. Oh, we are free from all that. And we may go further and get from this a sense of superiority over religious people and just superstitious people, we may call them. We may feel superior and sophisticated, but the plain fact is we are not free. We are never free as human beings. It's a myth. Know ye not? The Apostle Paul is able to put it this way because it is such a basic fundamental of life. Do you not know your two times table? He's almost speaking down to us. Do you not know your alphabet? Do you not know the most elementary things? That's the tone of voice we detect here. Know ye not, are you really so simple? That to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are. So you turn from God and you obey some other ideology or some other adopted policy for life and you are a servant of that policy, a slave of that policy, a slave of that power, that force to which you've turned. You are never free. You are in its hands. You are its victim. And this is such a fundamental issue of life and yet People seem unaware of it. Ah, free from God, free from religion, free from ties, they may think. Restrictions, anything that I may not like. I'm free as the air. Certainly, that is never the case. We are not free. Now, the fact is that as the scripture teaches us, the human constitution is such, we are made by God to be worshippers. That's another fundamental fact. That is how we are made, because we are fashioned by God, we are creatures of God, and we're fashioned for him. Then we are made to be dependent beings and worshipping beings. However great, however great your achievements and accomplishments, however high you rise in life or in the world, well, all due respect to you, you've got fantastic abilities and you've worked hard and you've done all the rise and wise and right things in your profession or whatever your chosen pursuit is. But the fact is that you're made to be a worshiper of God and to pay homage to him and to study him and explore him and bring glory to him and depend upon him and pray to him. 
Seek him, find him, follow him. And if you don't, then all those tendencies and capacities for worship and your needs will be turned to something else or perhaps a variety of things. And they will become your masters, the things you can't do without, the things you in effect serve. Those are the things which you will be enslaved to. If not God, there'll be an alternative. You have a mind, the power of reason. You have a heart, an emotional system, affections. You have a will, the volitional faculty. And all those three elements of your personality and your being will be in the grip of whatever your chosen idol or pursuit which is substituted for Almighty God. That's why the human race creates so many artificial gods, idols perhaps, images in time past, multitude of cults and strange faiths and religions fashioned by the minds of men. If they don't follow the true God, very often they'll follow a God of their own making, of their own manufacture, one with different standards, one with different ideals, one that will give them greater license. But the fact that there are so many faiths and religions and idols and so on only indicates what we're saying and proves what the Bible tells us, that we are constituted as worshipping beings. And we feel these needs, even if we fulfill them in our own fictitious and wrong ways. So we're looking at this text. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are. Well, friends, what is worshipped by us? What is the focus of your mind and your dependence? Worshipping. We need to humble ourselves before something, be admirers of something, serve and obey something. Well, if it isn't idols, it'll be perhaps notable people. Who are the objects of your admiration? and your dependence even, or what? All kinds of people these days, entertainers, people who have athletic accomplishments and so on. Possessions, of course, are very, very popular God. You may have quite a number of idols in your life, things that you need, things that you'll spend any amount of money and effort to get, things that you'll revel in, which will mean so much to you, and you'll derive your happiness and your sense of well-being from these things because you possess them. If they're taken away from them, from you, you've lost all that. Some people worship politics and power. Fewer and fewer, I would think, these days, as the world goes on and governments fail. Well, we need governments. We have to support them and they're important to us, all of them of every different kind. And yet we see human failure and inadequacy and weakness and enthusiasm wanes. So maybe you put all your uh, worship into entertainment, into music. Maybe you live with an iPod and you have it crashing into your brain the whole time. And you need those rhythms as mood lifters and so on. It's your audio drug, it's essential to you. You're an addict, it's your idol, whatever it is. Art, music, family, self, we've got a variety of gods and we, they, these become the source of our hope and our fulfillment. Fads, urges, lusts, sins, all kinds of things are alternatives to God. Some things which in themselves are quite wholesome, they're not sinful. Some things, many things which are sinful, but the non-sinful ones are wrongly indulged because they're an alternative to God for satisfaction, for our desire and need to worship and depend and derive happiness from that thing. But these things, 
They're not worthy of you, friend. Young friend, if you think that all these alternative enthusiasms and uh, objects of affection and dependence and admiration, that uh, this is life, this isn't life. It's not worthy of you, you're a human being. You're made by God to be in, to walk with him, to know him, to draw from him, to learn of him. These things are much too small for you. They cannot create things. They cannot bring you truth and facts about your life and the world. They cannot give you fulfillment. They cannot give you communion, union with God. They cannot give you eternal life. They cannot do any of the things which your being and your soul needs. They cannot give you perspective on anything, a real view of your life and its meaning and your world. You're squandering your faculty of worship on things that are smaller than you are, less than you are. You're making small things great and you've made great things, the things of God, small in your estimation. You're out of balance. Hope I'm not offending you. I'm trying to be realistic and help you. You'll be an out of balance person entirely, a distorted person. Your highest, noblest part, your soul is being bowed down to earthly things. And it's turning you into a nobody. You've deployed it that way. Our text says so. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey. You've chosen to do this, to take your highest faculty and to dedicate it to small and earthly things. You've put yourself under the power of secularism, of atheism, of career, of entertainment. This is, fills your horizons of possessiveness and these things rule you. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are. You're the slave of those things. These things, you may not realize it, but they'll get a more powerful grip of, on you as time goes by. You'll become dependent upon them, utterly loyal to them. You won't see any happiness or joy in life or in the world or any meaning or purpose outside them beyond them. That's what will happen to you. You'll become a smaller, smaller, increasingly limited person and they'll rule you. You'll spend any amount of money for them, any amount of time for them, any amount of emotion for them. Some of the things may be quite reasonable things, wholesome things, which yes, you're entitled to indulge in reasonable measure, but they've become all you have, all you really enjoy all that really helps you. You may have a number of them, half a dozen different idols in life as an alternative to God, and these things will shape you. His servants ye are to whom ye obey, and they'll govern you and rule you. I'm going to look back to a psalm for a moment. It's Psalm 115, and uh, here you have the same message described in terms of idols. And this uh, is very helpful and instructive to us. Psalm 115 and verse 4. You're probably familiar with these words. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. Let me just explain this. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. We have invented these things, or rather made them gods in our lives, and the objects of our affection and dependence, and the basis of our happiness and well-being. Shutting out God and adopting human articles and means. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. Now there's a strange construction in these words. They have mouths, but they speak not. Why were the idols given mouths by the craftsmen who made them? Well, the, the ability to have a message or to say something to you was claimed 
for these lifeless images. So the Bible accurately says, they have mouths, but they speak not. Nothing comes out of them. There is no message. And that's exactly the same with the things that we use as alternatives to God. Oh, if, if you can only get this, this will give you well-being. If you can only have that, and you listen to this performer or that performer, and the lyrics and this and that, and this is a profound. This will speak to you. This will move you. This will lift you up. So mouths are claimed for a lot of the things that we follow instead of God. But actually, they have no message that can help you in any important way of life. They only tend to have messages which take from you or you, which lead you astray. They have no message which introduces you to God, which gets you his power, which gives you eternal life which brings you blessing from on high. And so this is, this is true. Mouths are claimed for them, we could roughly paraphrase, but they speak not in fact. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have no power to discern. None of the things that mean so much to people as alternatives to God can explain life and the future only such things come from the Bible. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Well, they cannot share you, these things that mean so much to you as alternatives to God. They don't know you. You cannot speak to them. They can't hear you. You cannot offload your grievances and your troubles and your burdens and your queries and your needs to them as you can to the true and living God and have his strength and his blessing and definite answers to your prayers, they can't hear you. They've got ears, but they hear not. They're insensitive to you. You're making friends of things that are incapable of returning your friendship or giving you counsel or understanding. Noses have they but they smell, smell not. They have no power to appreciate. You've got to do all the appreciating of them. They can't appreciate you or your situation, not at all, or love you and have affection for you. You must have all that for them. What inferior gods you've chosen. What pathetic things we choose. And then verse 7 they have hands, but they handle not. Yes, they've no power to help you, no power to build a life for you, to assist you as God has. Feet have they, but they walk not. They can't advance or lead you anywhere. And here's an interesting one, but I must hurry with this. Neither speak they through their throat. Well, the psalmist has already mentioned that the idols have no voice. So what does he mean when he says, neither speak they through their throats? And the Hebrew is very interesting and rather mysterious. And it means something like this. Neither can they utter an almost inaudible sound. What would that be? Well, it will be a sigh. It will be a murmur of approval. It will be something not articulated, but something which the kind of sound that somebody makes in extreme sympathy or even perhaps disapproval. In other words, they have no feelings, no affections. They cannot feel for you. They cannot caution you. They cannot do the kind of thing you do in just a murmur, just a whisper, just a sigh. There's no sentient life, there's no intelligent life in the things we choose to make gods. And yet, that's the life we've chosen. Don't talk to me about God. Don't talk to me about a savior. Don't talk to me about a creator, a God I may know and walk with. I don't want that. These are my gods. Things with no message, no help, no guidance, no sympathy, no feeling. 
Dear friends, you see, I don't want to be offensive to you and to rant at you or anything like that, but this may be your mistake. Don't make such a mistake. Don't sell your life like that. Don't squander your worshipping faculty on such things and insult God, the living God, in the process and offend him and reject and turn away from him. What a tragedy. Let's look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 16 again in the short time we have left. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey. What an interesting verb in the Greek. Yield yourselves. Translation is perfect. I'm not to, for one moment criticizing it. But you look behind the word yield. It is... Uh, a Greek word which uh, means or indicates to stand beside. Put you in mind of the kind of things you do as youngsters when there's uh, a bunch of lads want a game of football or, or girls want to play something that they will enjoy and you know how it is. Two captains may be appointed and there's two ways of doing this. Either they choose their people one says, I'll have him, the other says, I'll have him, and so on. So they make up their teams. Or the other way, which I think has gone out of fashion now from what I hear, but used to be the most popular way, is you get your two captains, and whoever wants to play with that one goes and stands next to him, and whoever wants to play with that one goes and stands next to him. And if one team is much bigger than the other, well, then they have to sort that out and siphon some people, decant them from one to the other. But you choose who you're going to play for or with. You stand beside him. And that's the verb which is used here in the Greek in verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye stand beside, it's your voluntary act. You're going to be a slave, which is not normally a voluntary thing, but in this case, you go and attach yourself to or stand beside your God. Of course, you don't think of it as a God, but your dedication to your favorite entertainment or performer or whatever. And it's like somebody goes and stands beside that. Didn't you know that's nothing like as innocent as it sounds? Having done that, and decided to obey and to follow that pursuit, that thing, that person, well then, you become the servant of that person, of that fad, that sin. It'll grip you. It'll get its tentacles round you. It'll take you over. It'll mean everything to you. You won't be able to stop it. You won't be able to part with it. Oh, yes, I will be able to. I can pick things up and I can drop them. No, you can't, says the Bible. A lot of these things will have an uncanny and mysterious hold on you. Didn't you know it's a fundamental? You stand beside something, yield yourself to it, and you're in its power, and it will rule you. There's no question about it. There'll be no escape. You'll have an increasing need for it. And it may introduce other masters too to control you. And uh, you'll be more and more committed to those things, to those alternatives to God. They won't pay you. They won't, you're a slave. In olden times, they were cruel. The average master had no duty to his slave he felt no obligation for his slave's welfare. He would not go out of his way to look after a slave or show kindness or pity to a slave or show gratitude to a slave. And neither will these things have the power to show any gratitude to you. You've got to give them, pay for them, fund them, support them, follow them, give yourself to them, and yet, it has a power over you, and it takes you over, and you cannot drop these things. Verse 16, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death. 
sin leading to death. And that's what it will do. It is sinful for your worshipping faculty to be spent out on things that are alternatives to God because you will not have him. And it will bring you under condemnation. And it will get worse and it will lead you and trap you all the way to death and the end of life. And of course, God is angry with you because you've offended him. You're not only a sinner against him in so many ways in life, in your things you do and the things you are, we're all under God's condemnation as sinners and we need his forgiveness, his forgiving love. But you've offended him even more by willfully transferring your gratitude and worship and obedience and respect from him to the little, the trivial, and often even the sinful things of this present world. And he is snubbed by you, and he's held in contempt by you, and you hate his laws, and you will not talk to him or submit to him at all. And for that, you will come under judgment, and he will reject you. And so the Apostle Paul rightly says in verse 16, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now you'll approach the end of life, having spent your life for things on earth. Why, you'll be like that. Uh, any number of people have been described like this. There's a French epitaph which was... Uh, uh, found in a book by Matthew Arnold, part of his collection of epitaphs. Born a man, died a grocer. What a terrible thing to say. Born a man, with all the gifts and the powers of a man, died, completely sold out to his business. Petty-minded, limited to the counter and to the trade. What a sad thing. Or you, young person, might it be said of you if you died early? Born a man, died a rock junkie. Nothing more to be said about you. Just an addict to passing fashions and trivial things. Or young woman, born a woman, died a mirror junkie only concerned with fashion and image, nothing more to you, nothing greater, the worshipping faculty, never exercised, no communion with God, no eternal future. What a tragedy. Don't let it happen to you. Don't be like that, friends. See what happens in life when God is rejected and how small we become, how trivial, how sad, how enslaved, how pathetic. Look at our text. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants, slaves to obey, his servants ye are. You become the property of your chosen idol, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Oh, dear friends, I must come to conclusion, obedience unto righteousness. Let me read verse 9 to you, and teen to you. Couldn't be put better than this. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, your bodily faculties, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now. Yield your members, your faculties, servants to righteousness and to holiness. That's the appeal to our hearts of the Apostle Paul. Stand beside someone else, Christ Jesus the Lord, the eternal second person of the Trinity, the Son of God who came from heaven to earth to purchase salvation for billions of people who would be his. Stand beside him, not as a proud volunteer, not as somebody worthy of him, but go to him 
as the great physician. You know what happened when he was on earth? He healed and he healed and he healed all kinds of illnesses and infirmities. Why he could restore people who had withered limbs, wasted limbs. Why, it's impossible to even the best of medical science. You cannot restore the limb. You can certainly give an artificial limb, but you can't do something so wonderful that the limb, just the, the withered, deteriorated limb, reconstructs in front of your eyes and rebuilds itself. The wonderful things that Christ could do to demonstrate his divine power and his kindness and his saving role. And wherever he went, crowds of people would gather and people would line up for him to help them and to heal them. And people would bring others, sick relatives and friends who couldn't move, who couldn't walk, and they'd carry them and bring them. You know, these accounts from the Gospels, I'm sure. And they would stand by him and at a word or at a look, he would heal them. Well, that's how you come to Christ for spiritual salvation for forgiveness of sin, for transformation of life. You yield your life to him. You, as it were, go and stand where he is. And you do it in prayer. You close your eyes, find a quiet place. You say, Lord, I've been a fool. I've worshipped all kinds of things, trivial things, good things, gifts given to human beings, but I've worshipped them in excess. I've made them my gods. I've given my life to them and not to thee. I've worshipped anything rather than come under thy rule and thy care and thy government. So, dear friends, go to him and own your sin and tell him you long for his forgiveness and you trust in what he's done in suffering and dying for sinners on Calvary and taking their eternal punishment for them. All who would come to him, go to him and stand by him as the great physician. Go to him, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, go and align yourself with the one who can give you life after death. And one day a resurrection body and take you into his eternal glory to worship and to adore and to learn of him and to know that everlasting bliss. Go to the one who is the bread of life, the shepherd of the sheep, the true saviour. Go to him, go to the saviour who died on Calvary and trust in what he's done to purchase forgiveness for you and to secure your salvation. Servants to obey. Obey him, friends. Obey him first by trusting him and what he's done. Obey him second by repenting of all your sin. Obey him third. These are the things he requires of you by asking him for new life, that you should be born again, made a new creature, given a new nature, Ask for communion with himself. Promise that you'll be his, unworthy as you are, if he will only take you and change you and bless you. Come to him. This is the most basic principle of life. Don't forget it, friends. Don't run from Christ. Don't think you've got to shy away from him, young person, because so many of your associates have. Know ye not, don't you know this, that to whom or to what ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants, his slaves, ye are. You become slaves to those alternative gods, objects of worship, whether of sin unto death, It'll take you all the way to death of obedience to Christ, which will bring you to righteousness, a new life that he will give you of righteousness 
and obedience to himself. Dear friends, I read verse 20 and close with these words. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. You didn't have to worry about obeying God. You were a slave of sin. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin, because Christ has died for you, and taken your punishment and condemnation for you, and become servants to God. You know him, you found him, you love him. Ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's the greatest principle of life. The one to whom you yield is the one whose servant you become. Whether you yield to God, to Christ, or whether you yield to all the alternative idols in life. There's no middle course. It's one or the other. Oh, dear friends, you must seek the Lord and find him while you can and while he'll have you. Let's pray. Oh Lord, look upon us. Grant us an insight into life and its meaning. Write these things upon our hearts. Oh Lord, make these things urgent in our estimation. Help us, oh Lord, that we shall not be plucked away by the short-term enticements of this present life. Grant, O oh God, that we may seek thee and find thee and know thee and have thee forever. O oh Lord, bless each one here this night. We ask it in the name of our Saviour, for his sake. Amen.